Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. As part of our ongoing series on the Austrian School of Economics, I have Peru Saxena, founder and chief executive officer of Peru Saxena Wealth Management in Hong Kong, joining us this morning. Welcome back, Peru. Morning, Gordon. How quickly the time goes, and I'm looking forward to talking on a number of these subjects here the, the, this morning. Peru, some of the people, some of our listeners may not have heard your first interview with us. Could you just give them a brief overview of your background and uh, Peru Saxena Wealth Management? Sure. Uh, my, I run an investment management firm here in Hong Kong. The firm is uh, regulated by the Securities and Futures Commission, and we manage discretionary investment uh, portfolios for investors. We run three strategies, uh, trend following equity portfolio, a trend following uh, ETF portfolio, and also a blue chip portfolio, which is uh, comprised of some of the best companies in the world. And uh, we also publish economic uh, and investment research called Money Matters. The newsletter is available from our website, which is www.prusexina.com. Prue, this is, as I said at the beginning, as part of a series on uh, Austrian economics. And one of the cornerstones of the Austrian school is, is the ability to restrict the central bank's ability just to print money and credit, or the ability to restrict it. And one of the things was the gold standard originally of, of, of being able to secure it. What is your views on restricting or, or the ability to control central banks' growth of their balance sheet? Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Gordon, uh, the financial markets are now so distorted and so twisted that none of the reliable indicators are working. Everything is backwards. Bad news is now good news. Stocks go up on good news. Stocks go up on bad news because of the put which has been provided by the central banks. And it's a case of investors uh, basically becoming like the donkey with the co coward dangling in front of them, which is called stimulus. So you have this imaginary growth or elusive growth which has been promised by the central planners and the carrot is dangling and the donkey keeps running in front uh, looking in, in search of the food but the food never gets to it because the carrot is dangling with a big pole in front so you, the donkey never gets there but the people are so conditioned now of believing the stimulus jargon that every time any central bank uh, utters the word stimulus or more QE everybody suddenly starts buying stocks again good news is good news and bad news becomes good news and the stocks rally but i don't agree with this line of work or this line of thinking by the central banks they are doing what they're doing but if you look at the normal functioning of the financial markets it has been totally totally destroyed and uh, manipulated you know it just makes no sense at all and i just don't think that this monetary experiment or this fiscal experiment is going to end very well because if you look at Japan, Japan has tried this for God knows 25 years now and we have had recession after recession, long-term bond yields near historic lows, still 0% short-term interest rates and not much economic growth in Japan. So why the central banks in Europe and also in America, why they are doing this, nobody really knows. But I don't think it's going to be very successful. I think QE is actually detrimental to economic recovery. Yeah, I, I've read many studies and I've actually written about it where it's now worked. Quantitative easing may have helped initially for maybe 12 months in bringing demand forward, but now and at this sustained period, it is actually creating deflationary pressures because corporations, we've had oversupply of lost pricing power and 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 that in itself is creating all sorts of problems. But, but from, a, from a central bank standpoint, they may try more experiments. We're taught, we're hearing about negative interest rates. We're talking about uh, negative nominal interest rates. We're hearing about helicopter money or overt monetary financing. We're hearing about going to possible cashless society. What are you anticipating? Are you expecting a QE4? At some point, but not yet. I think if the S&P 500 goes down to sort of 14, 1500, which I think it will at some point next year, then you're going to have QE4 and possibly no, negative interest rates. Uh, the Fed officials, some of them have already alluded to the fact that they might come out with negative interest rates should the situation worsen. We have negative interest rates already throughout Europe. So it wouldn't surprise me that you have negative interest rates at some point in the US. How palatable that would be for the Congress is anybody's guess. 
but I do think that they will try and inflate this in a typical Keynesian manner. But the, what they're missing, Gordon, is that the problem isn't a liquidity problem. It is a debt problem. You know, yes. if you look at the debt the overhang in the world, the world has never, ever been so over indebted. You know, the debt to GDP ratio uh, is now over 280% globally. Um, or, although the household sector has delivered somewhat in the U.S. from about 100% of GDP to about 80% GDP at the household level, this has been more than compensated for by the huge buildup of debt in the corporate sector, which has gone from about three trillion to five trillion dollars with a T. There are these insane share buybacks going on, financial engineering going on because of zero interest rates for so many years. The government debt levels have gone through the roof in America. So there has not been any deleveraging which has occurred over the last six or seven years. And not only the US and Europe now, but even if you look at China, China's debt to GDP ratio is north of 280% as well. It's gone from 7 trillion to about 28 trillion with a T, fourfold ramp up in debt over the last six years or so. So when you have this huge debt built up or debt overhang, History has shown, several research papers have shown that the economic growth slows down because economic growth by definition comes from the private sector taking on more and more debt because when people borrow, they bring forward tomorrow's con uh, consumption today and they consume and you know they lever up, they buy assets, they go on holiday, they spend. All that is usually done by borrowing uh, in this society. So when people are already maxed out, you could drop rates to zero or even negative. If people are already up to the neck in debt, they're not going to borrow anymore. And Japan has seen this experiment fail. And for some bizarre reason, the central planners in every other country are now embarking on the same path. They do not realize that if somebody is already in debt with no income growth or wage growth or, God forbid, no job, they're not going to borrow anymore just because interest rates are at zero. And this is the key point they're missing. And history has shown that uh, high debt equals low economic growth and low inflation. And this is what is occurring now globally. I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree with you uh, more. Additionally, you can't take on debt unless you have collateral to post against it of some degree. And right now, we, do, we have insufficient growth in real cap, real collateral to sustain more debt. And most of the debt, the collateral itself is very questionable. So uh, that's why in many cases the banks are not lending. They don't believe in either the collateral is not there or they don't believe in that it's basically malinvestment. So, but, wh but what brings this to an end? Like what stops this from going on for another five years with this kind of process? Well, I think the collapse will. I think asset prices today are severely, severely overinflated. If you look at the stock market, the stock market is extremely overinflated. It is now the third most richly valued stock market based on the Cape P ratio. Robert Schiller was on CNBC. He sold all his stocks. He's completely in cash. A few other well-known economists have been warning about this for a while. Valuations are sky high. Uh, commodities have already deflated. We are in a deflationary, disinflationary environment, Gordon. The natural tendency of prices is to deflate because of the debt overhang. The central planners are trying to fight this tooth and nail by inflating and doing QE and all sorts of bizarre experiments. But I think at the end of the day, the monetary velocity is at a multi-decade low. So whatever they're doing is not working because the money velocity is extremely low and falling rapidly. So I think at some point, maybe next year, we are going to get a recession. At some point, we are going to get a global recession. And that basically will happen at a time where interest rates at the short end of the curve are at already zero. So this is the first time when the world will head into a recession uh, when interest rates are already at zero. And historically, central banks have combated the recession by cutting interest rates. And now we are already at zero. And I think asset prices are going to deflate quite sharply. And when that happens, I think there is going to be chaos. And I think that's what's going to cause an end. And at some point, I think the government's or the people are going to stop and say, hey, this is not working. You know, we've had six or seven years of QE. Look at the economic growth rates in Europe. Look at the economic growth rate in Japan. Look at the economic growth rate in the U.S., which is now barely one and a half percent and falling. And by the way, you know, I track a number of economic indicators, all the Fed surveys, the future forward looking indicators, and they're all in recession territory. And historically, you know, these guys lead. And then you have the ISM manufacturing follow and then the unemployment and the GDP comes last. And most of the indicators now on the forward end 
are now already in recession territory. You know, the inventory levels are very, very high. Inventory to sales ratios are off the charts at pre-recession levels. So I think there's been a lot of, of uh, channel stuffing going on, a lot of in the revenues that the companies are announcing, barring a few big mega cap tech companies, their revenues and earnings are actually down year over year. So I think a recession will do it, Gordon. When the recession happens and you've had six or seven years of failed QE, I think investors are going to realize that QE is not the solution and they may not even buy it anymore. Yeah, I think there's the generally starting to starting to disbelieve in quantitative easing, <clears throat> and that event will bring the reality to even the mainline in, in investors. But I believe that the central banks will double down with more programs to attempt in different fashions. At that point, uh, whether they'll be successful for, but it's nothing more than just buying a little bit more time at at, at best. Would there be a chance of hyperinflation at that point in time? Because clearly we're in a deflationary cycle now. And there's no question in my mind on that. But at that point, when we start to get that, let's your number down to 13, 1400 on the S&P, <coughs> excuse me, and the, and the central banks step in, they could reverse the uh, the excess reserves at the central banks. We have $3 trillion now. That could, that could create a sense of hyperinflation or high inflation. Is that a possibility? I don't think it's because they can do whatever they want unless they issue checks to every household in the U.S. to spend, which I don't see happening anytime soon. I don't think we're going to get hyperinflation because they may print more and more money and buy bonds and so forth by QE, which is what they're doing, which is essentially an asset swap. All this money is now being built as excess reserves within the banking system. Investors and households and private, uh, they have not borrowed and spent this money. And unless that happens at a big frantic pace, we are not going to get high inflation or hyperinflation. QE in, in, in itself is not inflationary or hyperinflation. Yeah, I don't believe, I agree with you. I don't believe a quantitative easing four will, will be the catalyst for that. I think it'll be what we call helicopter money. And it would only be allowed in severe a crisis. Congress would only begin to entertain this at negative rates uh, to combat something they have no other way of doing. It. And if we are in a recession, and it's coming, it's so it's overdue. And I, I, all my indicators say the same same as you. So it's a matter of time. We just don't know when, uh, but it'll be how they react. What is your, what is your outlook? You're giving a sense that you think this will go on into 2016 before this recession hits. Well, Gordon, I'm of the view that a bear market, a primary bear market in stocks started in Ju July, August of this year. <clears throat> we have had this huge rally in uh, equities. Uh, but if you look at the breadth of the market and the internals, which we follow religiously every day at our firm, only a handful of mega cap stocks are driving this rally. If you look at the Russell 2000 growth index, the Russell 2000 small cap index, the Dow Jones transportation average, the New York Stock Exchange advanced decline lines, especially the common stock only advanced decline lines, the HYG, which is the high yield or junk bond ETF. And none of these assets or these sectors are confirming the ongoing party on Wall Street. In a healthy bull market or in a healthy bounce in a um, bull market, the mid cap, the small cap stocks go through the roof. The transportation average uh, confirms the rally. The breadth is usually very strong, and the junk bond market also tends to go with the stock market so far in this rally, and it may change tomorrow, but so far, that hasn't happened. If you look at the transportation average, the Russell 2000 growth, the Russell 2000 small cap, they are not even above their September highs, would you believe? So for me, this is a classic sign of the market breadth narrowing, and this has been observed right at the top of every bull market throughout yeah. the past seven or eight decades. The 80 lines uh, peaked, the advanced decline lines peaked in uh, April and May, and the common stock on the advanced decline line is way below uh, the all-time highs. If you look at the S&P 500 equal weighted index, which doesn't actually uh, weight the index according to the market cap, it is nowhere near the old highs. It is way below the old highs. It has only recovered about 50% of the losses. And it has re been rejected recently right on the 200-day moving average. So all these pointers to me suggest that this is the last hurrah in the bull market. And we may make a new marginal highs on the major indices. But I don't think these highs are going to prove sustainable or durable. 
And I think next year we're going to see some severe losses in equities. How are you positioning yourself right now for the short term and the intermediate term? Well, Gordon, we've allocated roughly 40% of the capital we manage uh, in long-term treasuries. Uh, we've got about 20% in 30-year uh, uh, U.S. government bonds. We've got about 20% in 25-year plus zero coupon bonds. Uh, that is our play on deflation. We think if there is a recession and an economic slowdown next year, uh, bond yields in the U.S. are going to go lower, uh, even lower than where they were in January. So we've got a position there. We've got a modest position in Japanese yen cash. About 20% of our book is in Japanese yen cash. Uh, we've got some short-term U.S. treasuries. We've got a very small position in uh, double short biotechnology because we think that is a bubble. And, and if when this uh, latest rally runs its course, we are planning on adding some more short positions on the S&P 500 index and also on the emerging markets because I think if there is a global slowdown recession next year, it is conceivable that the emerging markets are really going to take it on the chin. What, what, Peru, what signals, and you mentioned quite a few that you've already watching to draw these conclusions, but what, what signals are you now focusing on to, to make the next set of decisions or to really prove that you know you're right on this? Well, at the moment, the S&P has gone past the 200-day moving average. If you look at the 200-day moving average, I define that as the line in the sand because primary bull markets happen above that and bear markets happen under the 200-day moving average. So the fact that the S&P 500 index and the NASDAQ composite and the industrials have barely gone above the 200-day moving average, to me, is a sign that things are very over, sort of overstretched at the moment. Uh, the rally has been vicious. So I'm waiting for a decisive close below the 200-day moving average on rising volume. And that, to me, would indicate that the next leg down is here. And at the moment, you know, the market may go up somewhat more based on the euphoria which is currently uh, taking place on Wall Street. Uh, everybody's convinced this is a new bull market. My work tends to think that this is not. So I'm looking for a decisive break of those 200 moving averages. And if you look at the transportation average, it's already rolling over. You know, Union Pacific, the big railroad in the U.S., uh, is now dropping uh, quite fast. So I think... The indicators are saying that we are there yet, but we, I'm not really ready to pull the trigger to add on more shorts. I'm just waiting for some confirmation from the price that we have seen the, the highs of this uh, bear market rally, and then I will put on the shorts again. And that's what it is. It's a bear market counter rally right now uh, from the August turn. That's what I think. That's my view. I may be wrong. You know, if they come out with some helicopter drop tomorrow, then everything is off the table. And that's what I mean. You know, it has become so difficult for us to manage money in this environment because, you know, you never know where the next red herring will come out, come from. You know, Draghi comes out one day and he says he's going to expand QE. The PBOC cuts interest rates. The U.S. says one minute they're going to raise interest rates. The next minute they're going to say they're not going to raise interest rates. So it is an extremely challenging environment uh, to make any wise capital allocation decisions. And the more intervention that goes on, I think the harder it will be for everybody, not just for investors like us, but for business owners how, about how to plan for their future. It's just becoming impossible. It used to be, as you were saying, doing the kind of research that you do, you could make logical decisions. And those logical decisions, if you'd done correct research as an investor, made you money. Today, that's not what's happening. It's more like a casino. And, and what's happening is the casino orders keep adjusting the wheel, uh, manipulating it. So it's just, it's not, it's not investing anymore. It's almost speculating and gambling. So it's a very, very bad time in that regard. So that, that's what the professionals, I think, generally are seeing. What do you think the, what do you think people are getting wrong about mark, the market right now? What are the beliefs that are really not founded correctly? My biggest concern is that investors are still of the belief that QE works and stimulus works. Uh, we had two head fakes in this QE um, era. You know, the first one was that QE causes inflation and hyperinflation. And everybody drove up the prices of commodities to multi-year highs thinking, oh my God, they're printing money. This is going to be hyperinflationary. The dollar is going to disappear. Everything is going to disappear. Things are going to become so expensive and everybody hoarded commodities. You know, the silver went up to $50, gold was at 1900 oil was above 100 uh, and then suddenly the market realized that QE doesn't cause hyperinflation, and then we had the top in commodities and prices have been falling for four years. My biggest worry now is that investors believe 
that QE causes economic growth. Uh, they still believe that, erroneously. I don't believe that at all. But the market still thinks that more stimulus will cause economic recoveries and economic growth. And when it dawns on the market participants that economic recovery does not happen because of QE and that this stimulus is actually anti-growth, then you will see a big, big sell-off in equities. Because if you look at the valuations, Gordon, of some of these companies, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to valuations. The future returns depend on the valuations, current valuations at what price you pay to buy into that company. If you look at these valuations of some of the growth names like Visa, Nike, Starbucks, you know, the companies which have got decent revenue and EPS growth, the P ratios on these things are over 30, 35, uh, which is alarming given the economic environment that we're in because even if a business is growing at 15 or 17 percent a year, paying twice that earnings uh, rate or growth rate for a company after a six and a half year bull run doesn't make much sense to me because nothing grows to through the heavens. You know, no tree keeps going, growing. At some point, you have a contraction, markets go up and markets go down. And that's what I've learned. The one thing I've learned after spending 16 years in this business is that markets go up and markets go down. There is no one-way street. So I think the market currently is of the uh, sort of illusion that more stimulus is going to solve the problems and you're going to have a fantastic recovery. And that's why they're bidding up these prices. And also, I think there is a desperate search for yield, according because cash in the bank isn't really giving anybody anything. So the people are thinking, well, commodities are on their way down. Treasuries, I don't really understand them. I understand Nike, Coca-Cola and Visa. And maybe over the long term, I'll be fine. And let's just put my money in there to try and juice out the 1% or 1.5% dividend that you can get. And they're not really looking at the price that they're paying to buy into those companies. And they're not looking at the future earnings power of these companies, at least over the next two to three years. So I think this is the biggest worry for me. And honestly, I'm now sitting here on my chair and thinking, well, if the market does make a new high because of some new antic by the central banks, do I really want to chase this rally and buy, you know, overvalued, overinflated stocks at these prices and, you know, risk my clients hard earned money? into this thing because even if the market goes up from here, maybe it goes up another 10, 15% and then you're going to have the next leg down. So it is a very difficult position for me. I'm taking a career risk already by not being in stocks at the moment for the last three or four months. And if the S&P 500 goes to new highs and all the indicators and the works we've done proves us wrong, which is completely logical. But if it happens, then I will have to really think about whether I want to chase this rally or just give it a pass and stick with I it. I have learned, like you, markets go up and down, but I've also learned that they go down a lot faster than they go up. And so we've had a market that's went up very fast, which tells you that it could be a violent down. And uh, that's that's so that the draw and when the drawdowns, if you look at any historical levels or t time frames, uh, have been getting bigger and deeper and harder. Uh, and, spe and usually it's because PEs start to contract. And right now, the, if, the if you believe the global economy is slowing, these PEs make absolutely n no sense, it, it would appear. But uh, but unfortunately, we live in a, in a world where markets are, are, are going up. And, and investors are really looking for ideas of where they should be investing right now. Are there, and they're looking at diversification internationally. You gave you what you're doing with your portfolio. Are there some areas in the world where they could be diversified? Are there going to be some counter uh, opportunities, non-correlated? Because it seems the markets are so correlated right now, it's hard to find uncorrelated opportunities. I think investors should keep a large chunk of their money in cash right now. You don't have to be invested all the time. You know, for us, we are about 50, 60% in cash, in yen cash, in one to three year US treasuries. So there is no harm in holding the one asset which nobody wants to own, which is cash. You know, history shows that if you buy gold to the asset which nobody wants, the future returns tend to be quite good. So, you know, cash is something which nobody wants right now. It is hated all over the world. So holding some cash may not be a bad idea. I think long-term treasuries make some sense. I think the yen looks pretty, pretty cheap at the moment. Uh, and, you know, if you want to go into equities with some part of the portfolio, and if you have a long-term horizon, i.e. five years plus, then I think investors should start looking at some of the beaten down commodity areas. You know, commodities have been decimated over the last four years. Brazil is down massively from the highs. 
so is Russia. You know, these are some of the areas you may consider going in slowly, maybe 5 or 10% of your money at this point. But if we do get a global problem next year, Gordon, and if the U.S. stock market starts unraveling, then I suspect all the stock markets are going to go down. Even these uh, emerging markets are going to get hammered, especially the commodity producers. So if it was me, I would not buy any equities right now. It's very difficult for me to be bullish at these levels in this environment. I'm more leaning bearish at the moment. So we personally don't own any stocks on the long side for our clients at present. Maybe wrong, you know, it may go up from here and we may miss out on the last part of this rally. But I just think that the downside risks in owning stocks now are far greater than any upside potential. But, in, but you're on interest rates in the bond market. You believe interest rates are headed down, not up. And and so let, could you benchmark that? Where do you think the 10-year bond, 10-year U.S. Treasury is going to be in a year from now? You got a sense for that? Well, I think the 10-year uh, yield could drop down to sub-1%, and I think the 30-year uh, yield on the long bonds may drop down to about 2%, because the long-term interest rates are always determined by the level of inflation and economic growth. And if inflation keeps falling because of the carnage going on in the commodity prices and the dollar goes up because of the differential between the policies uh, by the Fed and the ECB, remember the Fed is heavy breathing about raising interest rates, and the ECB is coming out every second day and saying they're willing to add to the stimulus. So you have this divergence in monetary policy, which is going to be uh, beneficial for the dollar. And if the dollar goes up, then all the problems we faced in spring this year by a rising dollar are going to reemerge, and inflation rates are going to go down. And I think with them, uh, the long term. So a bigger play could be to stay in sovereign treasuries right now. Are looking at it. Well, we've got 40% of the book in long-term treasuries at the moment, uh, about 30-odd percent in short-term treasuries. So I still think, you know, given what the future expected returns are of the assets over the next couple of years, I think treasuries may not be a bad place. Drew, we're up against, how quickly time goes on these subjects. We're up against our hard line. Any closing comments you'd like to leave with our listeners? What is becoming very difficult? What is becoming very difficult? Like us, professionals like us, even for professionals like us, yesterday, looking at the data, yesterday, data, data announced by Germany, Germany data announced by Germany, the DAX was down, uh, the DAX was down to the open, six percent of went up, point nine percent at the close, nine percent. So somebody is buying, you know, we so somebody is buying, really you know, we've had some really full a few weeks ago, a few days ago, a few days ago, a few days ago, we had a BOJ meeting where the BOJ did not stimulus, and normally that would have meant, and normally that would have meant a fall in the stock market, a fall in the stock market, and within ten minutes of this announcement, the S and P announced. You know, one S&P reversal, one point and reversal, and that S&P futures, and, and, and that Nikkei popped up, and the Nikkei popped up within ten cents, and the yen weakened, and the yen so weakened. Everything is just backwards now. Everything is just everything is now. Just backwards everything now. Is just backwards investors now. Investors are still conditioned. Are still conditioned. Bad, bad news is good bad, news. Bad news. So is any bad news, they so just buy any bad news, they just buy risk assets. Think as well. Next round of stimulus. So I would be very wary. So I would be very wary. Promises by the promises by the banks at this point because they're invested in interest because they're invested in interest. Support this thing. Support this thing. Same. Central you know, bank, this is the same as central bank in 2005, that everything was wonderful, the US economy was great, the economy was there, was great. No problem, there was no problem, there was no problem, the subprime was contained, didn't matter. Didn't matter. And the same matter. people are saying the same the people are saying so I would be very now, so I would be very I would keep your ears and eyes open. I would keep your ears and eyes open around C really around you and really how the how engage how the activity economic activity is the policy makers leading the policy makers because where I live clear slowdown clear slowdown in business act. In business we, activity, there are some so there are some there are some office there are lying there. Office, there our office is building for our office is building for months up slow down sales are slow down now rents are now rents and property prices are sliding property prices are sliding now agents on the windows you see prices on the windows you see so we are seeing the initial cracks so we are seeing the initial cracks so I would be very very skeptical so I would be very very skeptical and Another thing, uh, market is another thing, thing market is the price level. Proportional to the price level. If you've had a big run, if you've had a big run, then the S&P 500, 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 the magnitude of the advance then is very similar to the magnitude of the advance now. So I would be very, very skeptical of whoever tells you that this bull market will continue endlessly. History suggests that bull markets end. They always have, they always will. So I think we are now in the topping process as opposed to the start of a new bull market. And every time it, the markets make no sense and, they're, and uh, the, the media is hyping how positive things are, 
it's ended badly. And the last time I thought I was thinking the markets made no sense, I remember was 86, 1999, and 2006. And they all were very serious corrections that, that came after. But it was the same kinds of scenarios for different, different reasons. Peru, can you tell our listeners how they could learn more about your writings and your and, and your fund? Well, sure. We manage a discretionary investment portfolio, segregated accounts. We don't run a fund. Uh, we basically accept business now from U.S. Uh, citizens and U.S. residents. Our custodian is fully FACTA compliant, so we can accept business from Americans. Uh, if your uh, listeners and viewers are interested in finding out more about our work, they can go to my website, which is www.perusec.com. Seeing the details are on there, and if investors are interested in subscribing to our newsletter, Money Matters, they can do so online. Crew, thank you very much for joining us. Unfortunately, we had a few technical issues here in our show, and I hope our listeners bear with us on this. But uh, great, great discussion. We'll have you back again. Talk to you again. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Roland. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Bye.